Okay, so uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, George Chu. Uh, George is a uh, principal staff engineer at the Johns Hopkins uh, University Applied Physics Laboratory, and he was the missions uh, operations manager for that mission we'll talk about today, which successfully impacted with the asteroid Dimorphos in September 2022. Uh, George brings 24 years of experience uh, at APL in the operation of robotic spacecraft missions from NASA, such as IMAP, uh, Solar Parker Solar Probe, uh, the Van Allen Probes, uh, Stereo, which I think a lot of us are familiar with, and Time. So George, welcome to uh, Rob. Uh, that the risk is presented with 
there's a whole range of asteroid sizes uh, that are out in space that have the potential to impact Earth. But uh, you can see that you know, the smallest ones, I think, by definition, an asteroid is like anything that can go over a year in size. But, you know, the, the smallest that we have here on the chart, the four meter size asteroids, you know, there's, there's a huge number of these out in space. By the way. You know, but these, and these, uh, and these, these are impacting the Earth all the time, and most of the time it's just producing a flash of light, or uh, uh, sometimes we get the meteorite. Right. Uh, but on the opposite end of the spectrum here is you've got your you know, asteroids that you're assigned in kilometers. And so this, this, this last 10,000 meter size asteroid, uh, I think that's what people call it dinosaur killers. Uh, but they only come, you know, they only impact uh, Europe every you know, hundreds of years. And you can see that you know, uh, the larger the asteroids get, the, the fewer of them are out there that cause a hazard. Uh, the other thing I was pointing out is that there's our knowledge of what's out there. The smallest ones, obviously, they just don't really affect us that much. And, I mean, they're small enough that we don't really know that they're coming until maybe the last second, last month. I think we did have the one coming in over South Africa a couple of weeks ago. But we didn't know about that, but there was only one. Um, but the, these dinosaur killers, I mean, they're easily detectable. We know where they are. But if you go down, as the asteroids get smaller, we know less and less about how many of them out there and, and the orbits that they're on, how much the risk they actually do. So, uh, so these largest asteroids know where they are for the most part, and so they're not really considered that much of a risk. The smallest ones are do not that much of a risk just because they're small. But it's this middle region here which folks are interested in mostly. Is those are the ones that are The hazard, um, where we, we roughly only know where about half of them are, and so I know there are missions completed uh, for the future to try to get uh, to the infrared telescope, news from their mission, that are trying to get a better grip on, on identifying all the objects of this size that are out there. I mean, some of the problem is that we definitely have a problem asteroids which have orbits which are closer in to the sun than the Earth is because they're only kind of, uh, you can only observe them in daylight. They're, they're masked by the sun. So, uh, quick overview. Uh, well, I mean, Uh, the planetary defense, NASA put together a planetary defense coordination office in 2016 to directly address uh, the asteroid risk. And so I don't want to go, I mean, I uh, don't need to go too deeply into this. It's not really my specialty anyway, but you see the fabulous success on how to are out there. Uh, identify where they, uh, identify where they are, uh, try to characterize them. Try to coordinate uh, the different things you need to do to address the risk. Uh, and so we have to deal with the risk. But this last area, uh, uh, so once you've identified the risk, how do you mitigate it? What are the things you have to do to, to respond to the risk? So that's, that's what the DART mission uh, is specifically so, uh, so there have been uh, a few techniques proposed for how you uh, mitigate the risk, and a lot of it depends on how big is the object you're trying to mitigate it, and how much you come and what you have. Uh, if you know, uh, 
that's what it takes to in 10 years versus 15 or 100 years, you have different options available to, to uh, try to address the risk. Uh, so, uh, so I, I, you know, I, well, I, I don't want to go too much into this, but uh, the central part of this is that the, the, the mitigation method that the uh, defense office was had uh, had highest on their list of priorities was the kinetic impactor, which is we can use uh, spacecraft's uh, kinetic energy or momentum in order to uh, modify the orbit of an asteroid. Through that that technique uh, caused an asteroid to otherwise spread. Yes, I mean, there have been table top studies where we try to coordinate, uh, where they kind of walk through the different, different, uh, different government organizations that would be involved in all this, you know, and so, yeah, civil defense would be perhaps evacuating a region that would be expected uh, to suffer an extreme strain, something like that. So, yeah, so that's, that's that aspect. If you, know, if you don't really have a lot of warning time, or if it, you know, if it's that, thing, oh. that may be your own option. So, work with civil defense to try, to try to try to mitigate the risk. Of it. So, why? So, we're. The idea here is uh, dark mission is, uh, is, is designed to test the kinetic impactor method of uh, uh, asteroid uh, uh, risk mitigation, asteroid risk mitigation. And so the idea with the dark mission, it's a novel idea with the dark mission, is to, is to perform the, the run of kinetic or the run of impact, impact the spacecraft with an asteroid that is part of the double asteroid system. Uh, the problem is you, know, you, you could target an asteroid. Well, first, asteroids of the size of the bridge are like 160 meters. They're not easily identifiable to begin with. Um, but the, the actual effect of the impact on, uh, on, uh, on the orbit around the sun, the heliocentric orbit, is actually not that high. So that's why they say, in order for this technique to be effective, you have to be able to do these five figures of things. Uh, so what you get is a, so the idea with a, with a double asteroid system is you end up with, you have a system where the impact, the effects of the impact are so in this case, we have a main asteroid, Didymos, and uh, a secondary asteroid, Amorphous, which orbits <coughs> around the main asteroid. And so that orbits about every 12 hours or so. And, uh, so they're actually not that far apart. But so the energy that's captured in that orbit is not that high. And so the ability to alter that orbit with an impact is far more measurable in this case than it would be just a single asteroid. So, uh, so I don't think that would much of this, this graphic here. The impact is uh, the, the smaller asteroid with their spacecraft. Uh, uh, part of the mission was we did have a, a, a CubeSat, a tie-in uh, called Nichicube, which is right pinned back on our own spacecraft. Mm -hmm. so, uh, a week or two before the impact, uh, we uh, released them for our own spacecraft. They did their own commissioning quickly. And so they were able to fly by the impact area and survive the impact. And they were able to take care of the case. So one of the central uh, 
importance of writing this kind of series, we wanted to run it while the asteroid was close to the Earth. So it would only have to happen nearby the Earth. So, in, so the mission was designed to impact uh, dimorphous in September 2022, when the asteroid was only 7 million miles away from the Earth. And so that uh, allowed us, allow, supported the whole uh, campaign the ground observations with the ground telescopes and radar observations. Uh, one of the central things is, uh, uh, I mean, one of the central uh, things that we were, they were measuring with the ground telescopes was uh, that uh, the duration of that orbit, uh, the slower asteroid around the margin line. So the duration of that orbit is easily measurable. You can tell when the smaller asteroid passed in front of the bottom line of the margin line. So from those measurements, you can you actually measure the amount of energy that the So it was a short mission. We launched in November 2021. And 10 months later, September 2022, was when we had it. Well, I didn't mention this, but most of the time, that asteroid <coughs> system is pretty far away from the Earth. So this is like more than two days away from the sun. And that's your own units away from the sun. So, uh, so this, this is a fortunate, uh, fortunate uh, that the impact uh, that, that uh, we were able to, to design this mission around the impact that was occurring relatively near the uh, Quick overview, uh, this is the spacecraft that we designed to satisfy the mission. Uh, a lot of this is, uh, these are sort of novel features that we have on the third spacecraft. Some of it was just a technology demonstration that uh, were specifically related to the, the, the mission, the goal of impacting the impact date of the asteroid. Uh, the other things were, uh, I don't want to go through everything in total detail. The solar arrays, I think, are the first uh, use on uh, unmanned space uh, or uh, our robotic space probe. And the roll down solar array, so these, when we launched, they were rolled up. Uh, it's sort of like a tape measure, and so we deployed them and just kind of smoothed out on it. So that was kind of a novel thing that hopefully they could use. Uh, and they produced some, a fair amount of engineering challenges because these are very, very large solar arrays for a fairly small spacecraft. Uh, and so mechanically, they just they would flex a lot. So Problem, uh, a challenge for the control of the spacecraft. But I think we did all, we did make sure we did all the characters. Uh, the components that, uh, that were more specifically related to the African asteroid, we had the Draco telescope, which are the optics. Uh, so those are essentially the measurements we use to target uh, the dimorphous asteroid. We also had an onboard uh, logic system, some of its image processing, and, and, but we had a, a smart nav onboard system which uh, was able to, to in real time, uh, by itself, correct the trajectory uh, as the, based on the incoming measurements. Uh, and, and for the most part, we're talking about uh, images from the Draco telescope. So those were processed in real time. So the, all this was uh, uh, occurred with pretty much no ground commanding or anything. It was all pretty uh, desiring to be automatic and they practiced it work well. Uh, again, Vichy Cube was our, uh, our uh, from the Italian Space Agency. It was a uh, uh, CubeSat that uh, we had a ride along and launched with us. And So we had deployed that uh, the set uh, 10 days before the attack, and so they 
I mean, uh, so what we're measuring is the orbit of water around the Earth, right? But you know, there is a conservation momentum happening here where the whole asteroid system is going to be affected by this, this atmosphere. <coughs> So we're talking about the difference between the and the And so there was a, there is an effect, small effect on this larger X-ray system. Uh, it's, it's, it, I the size of this larger Navigation imagery 
is using the onboard optics uh, as they got closer and closer to the asteroid. Uh, and so those images were used to help refine our, our trajectory estimates and the trajectory that did it most itself to refine our knowledge of that. Uh, so, uh, so throughout this whole period, we were running uh, trajectory correction maneuvers Three of them. Uh, so, uh, so there is a further uh, maneuvers to, to tweak our trajectory to get us on the course for uh, the main asteroid, uh, Didymos, at this point. Uh, again, you can only this spec here is Didymos. It's not the smaller asteroid. The smaller asteroid is not is not resolvable uh, until you're much closer. So this again, this loop is the lens. Uh, okay, so uh, you approach phase lasted out until four hours before the projected impact. And then at, at, at four hours is when we essentially handed over control of the spacecraft over to our smart van. Uh, targeting system uh, on board. So with that smart nav, it was all it was programmed to be able to, to, uh, to uh, continually co co correct the trajectory based on the images of uh, the asteroid system coming in. And even now, four hours before the impact, remember that the orbital period of the smaller asteroid rather larger than 12 hours. So four hours before the impact, the smaller was the asteroid was actually behind the larger one. So this whole, the mission was designed around the impact time where we were, uh, we were planned to do the impact uh, when the smaller asteroid was at its maximum separation. So, so it's a good half mission to try to identify more from behind the actual time of the impact they were at their maximum separation. But here they were not there was no separation at all. So that's from the line. And here's a series of uh, essentially image loops. Uh, and so I, I, I got different slides here for different milestones for the for the operation of the smart NAT system. What we're looking at here is about an hour and 15 minutes before the impact. This is actually our initial detection of the small asteroid that was actually planned. And so this, this early, uh, all you essentially see is a little bump on the side of this. Uh, make out something here. So, so, uh, so yeah, so I think so so we couldn't image the smaller asteroid until just more just a little more than that. So so George, what's the top and what's the bottom the difference? Uh you can't read it but so this says dimorphous here in the text. And this is oh, it's and so I have two images on the side. I think one is this is uh, this is kind of a saturated image, and this is this is more the gray one. So it's just a level of exposure. So yeah, these are zoomed in on uh, the, the, the two asteroids in the system. So this is one of the ones. Frame of the image that we got. Uh, okay, so this is uh, 15 minutes before the impact and we were working on the smart tax system that targeted the change of the small mass. I should say that before we even got to this point, uh, based on the navigation data that we, uh, we had a GPL navigation team, so we were doing uh, the normal radio metric estimates uh, based on Indian Doppler. Of course, they were using the optical navigation images as well. 
And it turns out that without any of the smart data functionality, the VE essentially would have hit that larger estimate the error error loops for for trajectory in the square length of the error streams. So here, 50 minutes before the impact is when we trace transition. So jumping ahead another half hour, so this is 20 minutes before impact. Uh, so here, uh, here the smart map system has a reliable, able to have reliable uh, identification of the bit of the morphous, the smaller asteroid. Uh, so you can see the big uh, And you see that it's only one kilometer apart? They're only one quarter small and large. So, yeah, so it's a small work. It's a very small work. Uh, and so it's only 20 minutes before impact. So this is actually close to the maximum separation. So, so uh, starting at eight minutes is when our smart man system actually started leaning heavily into, into operating our onboard thrusters. Uh, I should say the Dutch spacecraft was uh, entirely a thruster stabilized spacecraft. It didn't have any nationals or anything. But, uh, so, uh, so the smart net system was doing this, starting to get the smart net system was doing this uh, uh, trajectory, heavy, heavy uh, thruster activity in order to Target the smaller asteroid. So again, you can see getting more uh, resolution on these images. So this is uh, 3,000 kilometers of the system. I think what's not intuitive about some of these images is that, that our optics are actually our telescopes, so things do appear closer than they actually are. Our and our our closing loss is 14,000. So, this is starting. Oh, so these videos are kind of sped up. So, you're getting images about uh, once every one inch per second or something like that. So, what we're seeing here is it's all sped up right now, tenfold here. So, this is the final approach. So, uh, starting at two and a half minutes before the impact. Starting two and a half minutes, we essentially stopped trying to maneuver the spacecraft. We were just no, going to be Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, just before that. <laughs> so, two and a half minutes. Uh, so, uh, again, once you got to this this distance, there's some, you know, we're clearly seeing surface features and, you know, spark, and we wanted to start an assist. We didn't want to start an assist, but we be distracted by surface features and try to. So, such in the last two and a half minutes, we just increased it. Here's a video. Um, well, so we did do a uh, So this is just essentially taken from uh, the live stream. Uh, 
can always convene about this notion of the process of the Different levels of exposure coming out of the reality detail. And again, this 
this is a test for one specific type of object. Curve in and use curve This whole you know did the most on what this characterizing these things. The whole paralysis essentially, just the whole wide degree, which are very easy to work together. So we get a lot of objective. And of course there are other kinds of asteroids, there's some which are much more metallic, which you know which are held together not so loosely, so that, so the, the response is something like that. A question here. Were there any post impact measurements made with the dimensions of the impact crater? No. <laughs> uh, so that's also an interesting question because there are a lot of, again, I am sort of speaking as a public, sort of public observer of what the investigation team and the lighting community is publicized at this point. Uh, but I've heard theories, you know, that there are different. There is about what this what is asked what it looks like. Uh, is there an identifiable crater, identifiable crater you know, that you can see from that impact? But I've also seen models where the entire surface of the asteroid, because of the, the violence of the impact, the entire surface of the asteroid, the asteroid is essentially renewed. Right? So it would be interesting to see what happens. What, what, so there is another, there's a European Space Agency mission, which is uh, launching, I think, in October this year. And I don't know how many years it's going to take them to get out there. Uh, they're going to run the annual system. And for a long period of time, they'll be able to observe what it looks like. So, so sorry, off, to, off for grabs, you know, one really knows what uh, that impact site looks like. Oh, okay. 
And so this is a uh, European Space Agency. So these are just the, and so this is animations of the Hera mission coming up. I think the Hera mission has a couple of key stats of its own. Now they're riding along with that spacecraft. Uh, so they're going to have a key stat out of the hands on. Um, uh, I'm thinking uh, you know, gravity measurements as well. Uh, here is this craft. Again, that's the uh, weather uh, figure. Uh, That CubeSat, was that launched in the Falcon 9 or launched separately? Yeah, it's for uh, the one point like, dark. Uh, Excuse me? The CubeSat, each of you, the time of one that rode along with us, uh, dark space. Okay. So we have a dispenser on, the, on one of the sides of the dark space craft. And it's like spring loaded 10 days before the impact. Now, as a mission operations, were you also controlling? No. You did that as well? No, no, no. So, so no, it was separate. That was separate. Uh, it, it, it did produce a challenge for the yeah. space network. And, uh, it produced a girl communicating with your boat communicating with the space network. I saw, uh, uh, that was one of the cases where the space network uses a space wall and a space wall for space network aperture for the computer. Talking to Mars, he's a lot of missions that are over at Mars, so, so we can use the one antenna for the Mars and be able to do the space. Who is operating the people? Oh, you're talking to the space station. Do you think that? And so you were in close communications with them? As we were in close contact, we coordinated the deployment pretty closely, so we were uh, talking with them all about the but after that, we have basically planned out and sharing research over a communication network. You all had a rock boot the same place. So. Okay, yeah. So they would have to, I mean, so that was on their side. You know, we're focused on trying to impact the uh, asteroid, and they, uh, they would have to correct the logic of the yeah. so, you know, From the point of the ground, we were very close together. But because at the end, you said that they were less than 100 kilometers away. Yeah. Wow. So that's quite some coordination. Yeah, but I, mean, we're, I think we were basically following independent goals in that respect. I mean, what they would have to know when 